Good evening. Welcome to Asia Open Data webinar tonight on responding to COVID-19 by utilization and release of open data in Taiwan, Japan, and Korea. This webinar is co-hosted by Asia Open Data Partnership, Organization for Data-Driven Application in Taiwan, Code for Japan in Japan, and National Information Society Agency in the Republic of Korea. At 7 p.m. in Korea, Japan time, and 6 p.m. in Taiwan time. Welcome once again for those who have been virtually joined from Taiwan, Japan, Korea, and across Asia. And thank you so much for turning in tonight for the webinar. This is He Jung Lim. It's a great honor to be your MC and moderator through the webinar. I'm a senior manager working in the Department of Open Data from National Information Society Agency in Republic of Korea. Um, I'm in charge of Korea Open Data Assessment and Evaluation of Public Sector in Korea. As we all know, a number of countries are still combating against COVID-19, and COVID-19 continues to ravage the global economy, um, setting forth paths to what we call a new normal. However, Taiwan, Japan, and Korea were quite successful flattening the curve on COVID-19, keeping the number of infections and death tolls relatively low by fully leveraging digital solutions and ICT infrastructure. So there were more of a multi-stakeholder approach by optimizing digital tools than the process of generating top-down policies. By implementing data-driven solutions, Taiwan, Japan, and Korea were managed to contain virus and recover quite quickly. And decisive actions have taken at the early onset of the pandemic that there were also collaborative efforts of diverse stakeholders, including citizens and civic hackers, IT businesses, and developers as well. In this context, Taiwan, Japan, and Korea virtually gathered tonight to discuss how we have responded to COVID-19 by utilization and release of open data. I will not just solely discuss on the success factors, but we'd like to also elaborate on the lessons that we've learned and the hardships, difficulties that we've all gone through so far, and try to give insights, helping others for a better response. So in that sense, um, we'll be pleased to take in questions from multiple channels, such as few housekeeping rules for the questions. Um, you may leave your questions as comment in the live chat section in YouTube that you are watching right now. Or you also may find us in Twitter, hashtag AODP2020. Then um, you may also leave your questions to Slider. The event code is 97698. And all the detailed information is down in the YouTube information. So steps of Taiwan, Japan, and Korea are monitoring all the channels right now. So you may leave the questions in your own language. And they will be translating into English. And if you prefer to see the subtitles in your language on the webinar, you can attend MS Translator conversation through the link which presented in the YouTube section below. So everyone uh, is strongly encouraged to ask questions for the enlightening discussions to any of speakers tonight. Before I jump into the first session, um, let me briefly go over with the program of the webinar. We have four amazing speakers tonight with me. The very first keynote speech will be delivered by Audrey Tang, Taiwan Digital Minister. And cases will be delivered by its representative. From Japan, we have Hal Teki, TX Fellow to Tokyo Metropolitan Government, and he's a founder of Code for Japan. And from Korea, we have Han Jung Lee, Vice President of National Information Society Agency. And from Taiwan, we also have Dr. Chi Ming Pong, I'm chairman of Organization for Data Driven. And panel discussion will be followed by right away. So we'll be tackling the issues and insights, finding just a collaborative solution through a public-private partnership at national and international level. So without further ado, I would like to invite our very first speaker, Audrey Tan, Taiwan Digital Minister. Um, she started her own ID company at the age of 19, and in 2014, she became a digital advisor to Apple, and she has joined Taiwan's cabinet as digital minister since 2016, leading the innovative digital democracy in Taiwan. 
Um, in particular, um, she has emerged as a key figure in her government's response to COVID-19. Using her technological expertise, she launched the face mask map as the very first in the world. A joint initiative that brought together the government, software engineers, and civic hackers to provide an innovative technological solutions. So her actions have been lauded for maintaining government transparency. And tonight, we are eager to hear for an inside look of her government responding to COVID-19 and the digital innovation she's been leading. So virtually over to you, Audrey. The floor is all yours. Hello and have a local time uh, that is um, enjoyable, everyone. Uh, I believe we're in very similar local time, but in case that people are dialing in from other time zones, um, have a good local time to you as well. Uh, my talk will be driven uh, partly by Slido. So if you have not yet joined the Slido conversation or scanned a QR code, uh, please do so. Uh, and I will try to take into account the Slido questions during my keynote, uh, which is um, the digital social innovation. I think the digital social innovation is really what unites um, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan together because democracy improves only as more people participate. And digital technology in our East Asian context is still one of the best ways to improve participation because our common culture is on finding common ground and creating something we can all live with and not just uh, dividing or making sure that the ideological uh, divides and things like that. And so people who participate from all walks of life in order to public benefit the society, the civic technologists uh, is very vibrant. And we, I remember that uh, the three communities meet in Okinawa, which is kind of like the midpoint <laughs> between the three communities and work on such tools. But this is the first time because of the pandemic that those civic technologies become civil um, engineering infrastructure that um, more than half the population rely on. And this is a story of such digital social innovations in Taiwan. So uh, I characterize the digital social innovation using the pandemic as fast, fair, and fun. The fast part is important because whereas many countries begin countering coronavirus only this year, Taiwan started last year. Last December, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, posted that there are seven new SARS cases, he got inquiries and eventually punishment from his local police institution. But at the very same um, night, actually, the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit, the PTT board, has somebody with the name No More Pipe reposting that whistleblowing. And our medical officers immediately noticed this post and issued an order that says, starting the next day, the first day of 2020, all passengers flying in from Wuhan to Taiwan need to start health inspections. And this to me says two things. First, the civil society trusts the government enough to talk about possible new SARS outbreaks in the public forum. And the government, because we're um, the most uh, open society in terms of civic freedom, according to the Civicus Monitor, trusts the citizen enough to take it seriously and treat it as if SARS has happened again, something we've always been preparing since 2003. So for other liberal democracies, I think the point here is to keep an open mind on new and novel ideas from the society. So for example, Every day, our Central Epidemic Command Center hosts a press conference, which is always live streamed and answer all the questions from the journalists. But there's also a single hotline, 1922, that everybody can dial 1922 and tell their new idea to the CECC. For example, there was one day in April where a young boy said he don't want to go to school because his schoolmates may laugh at him for wearing a pink medical mask. The very next day, everybody in the CECC started wearing pink medical masks making sure that everybody learns about gender mainstreaming, which is again a social innovation. And so this kind of rapid response builds trust between the government and the civil society. Um, and so um, I think uh, I, I would say that the main credit goes to the civil society and their innovations. And there's a question on Slido that asks, so how do you encourage government to implement the idea of people to the policy? This is an excellent question. Uh, for example, when we ramp up the facial mask production, making sure that everybody can uh, collect the mask, uh, there's a lot of very good suggestions from the civil society. But how do we translate into actual policy? Well, we ask people to build prototypes. Uh, the spirit of Gov0 or G0V is for every government service something that GOV, the TW, that you don't like or you think you can do better, you just change the O to a zero. 
uh, and then you get into the shadow government that is built by the civil society with the same domain name. You don't even have to pay for advertisement. Um, and then people changing an O to a zero will see a civil society reimagining of that public service. So precisely that happened for our mask map allocation. There was a person called uh, Howard Wu, Wu Jiangwei from Tainan, and also uh, Fin Zheng Qiang, uh, also from Tainan. They prototyped two different maps by showing the availability of facial mask. At the beginning, Howard Wu's map rely on people voluntarily reporting the mask uh, storage level. But when I show it to the prime minister saying that, oh, this is a much better idea than anything that we can come with. This is very interesting because it flips the public-private partnership model around. The old model is based on procurement. We come up with, with the idea and the private sector implement those ideas. But now this is citizens coming up with ideas and we become their vendor. <laughs> we have to make sure that those good ideas, which has already spread through the society, gets the stable financial and resource support. For example, if you want to visualize how many pharmacists near you still have the mask, we need to publish open data, not through the usual way, which is every day or every week or every month. Um, this is not about the same thing as public information. This is about machine to machine bridging and open API that publishes every 30 seconds. And so this becomes like a participatory ledger. If you go to your nearby pharmacy, purchase nine masks if you're an adult or 10 if you're a child, you actually refresh the map and see the stock level deplete by nine or 10 after a couple of minutes. And so this is participatory accountability. That if people notice that when they publish uh, these numbers and they collect the mask and it actually increased the stock, they will call 1922 and report something fishy is going on. And so this is again, a mutual trust from all walks of life and including the pharmacist, which uh, requested a lot of feature from our open data uh, in the national health insurance to keep them uh, agreeing with the reality. And this is uh, also, how the civil society can show us the new designs. For example, there was a person called Jin Hong that de designed this dashboard that allows everybody in the society to see the supply and demand curve of how much uh, ramping up production actually affects different counties and cities of people. And we actually tune our uh, strategy every week based on this analysis by Jin Hong's dashboard. And uh, through analysis, we see, um, for example, we peaked at around 70% because there's um, a group of people live in municipality, live by themselves, who cannot collect masks because when they go off work, that's already 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. Uh, because they work uh, later in the day and no pharmacists remain open at that point. So we had to work uh, with the convenience stores where you can also take the same NHI card and pre-order and collect your mask anytime, 24 hours a day. So you see our premier, Su Chen Chang, smiling very happily because that was the day we started working with the convenience stores. Um, and so um, to the question that says, um, the digital divide has become more pronounced than ever before. My answer is that if you start empowering the people who are farthest away from the digital venues, as we see through the pharmacies, and then you gradually make it more convenient for people who are able to use apps or um, websites, but you never begin with only the halves. You begin with maximal inclusion. And then we make sure that digital adds to the social norm instead of excludes people from the social norm. I think this is very important and why the civic technologies are now considering themselves civil engineers. And finally, uh, the fun, which is called humor over rumor. So uh, whenever there is a, a pandemic, there's also a associated infodemic. Uh, for example, there was a panic buying of tissue papers uh, and the rumor that says it's the same material as facial mask because we uh, produce um, 2 million a day and we ramp it up to 20 million a day, uh, we will soon run out of tissue paper. So says the rumor. Um, and Taiwan, as I said, is a liberal democracy. We cannot uh, do a takedown just as we don't do a lockdown. So we make sure that we respect the journalistic freedom, but we introduce a funny picture so that people don't spread the rumor because it, the humor is more viral. And after they see the humor, they will not spread the rumor. And this is seen on Japanese television as well. So the same premiere you saw a few slides ago, uh, wiggling his bottom a little bit, uh, and says in very large font that uh, each of us only have one pair of bottoms, uh, meaning that it doesn't make sense 
to stock up tissue papers. Then, of course, the table that says um, the tissue paper are made out of South American material and the medical masks are made out of domestic material. So that's the real payload. That's the clarification that this meme want to deliver. But because it's very funny, uh, it shows a, a very clear public message and that went absolutely viral. And because of that, the panic buying of tissue paper died down within a day or two. And we eventually found out the person who spread the rumor in the first place was the tissue paper seller. And so this is not just a single shot in the social media. I think this is a, a whole strategy because we have in each ministry a team called participation officers who are uh, charged with engaging with stakeholders. So that's to respond to the slide of question, how uh, do we overcome the difficulty of uh, engaging stakeholders, of inviting the people who complain the most into co-creation workshops. Really, you need to make it into a habit in the public service. Every month, we go together, go through the public petitions and so on, and we vote um, by all the participation officers in all the different ministries, 32 ministries, over 100 people, um, who decide which two topics to work on that month uh, to maximize stakeholder engagement. And that, I think, is the culture that enables, for example, the participation officers of Ministry of Health and Welfare uh, live with this dog, and uh, uh, the dog, um, instead of paying Shutterstock, whenever the Central Epidemic Command Center uh, has a new announcement, like physical distancing, as shown here, um, our participation officers just go home and take a picture of the dog and post a picture of translation of the scientific knowledge introduced by the CECC. So if you are outdoor, you have to keep two dogs away from each other, if you're indoor, you have to keep three dogs away from each other. Otherwise, you need to put on a medical mask. And what this means is that um, people remember to pay for their pre-orders because the cute dog tells them to. People remember to uh, wear a mask as an indicator that we're not going to touch our face uh, and we're going to wash our hands properly. Um, they remember to cover their mouth and nose when sneezing. Uh, and there's no end of new dog pictures because all the uh, Zong Chai have to do is to post uh, different ways. So the Zong Chai is a dog model and is also part of the Taiwan model. So because of this, we make sure that our humor, our factual humor, backed by science, evidence, and data and citizen science, um, spreads faster than rumor. And that is how we make sure that Taiwanese people still feel calm and collected and participatory even during the pandemic. And so for um, the slide of question that asks about whether uh, this open government data open enough for PPP to better deal with this kind of issue, I think the point is that we need to flip around the PPP model is the social sector telling the public sector what data to publish and what the data to make available. It's not the public sector working with system integrators and, and other vendors alone. If the social um, data, the intersectional social data, have a strong enough uh, demand, have a strong enough mandate, then there really is no other choice because we're a liberal democracy. We cannot beat them. We must join them. And you see this uh, replicating not only on the air box or the water box on environmental data, but nowadays on mask availability data as well. So if you want to learn more, uh, there's more at Taiwan can help that us. Um, so that says who can help Taiwan, Taiwan can help, but we're also very happy that we'll be able uh, to learn from each other. And I personally learned from the Code for Japan's work on the uh, dashboard of the Stop COVID dashboard. Um, I contribute to the translation <laughs> and uh, making it available. And I'm very happy that the local civic um, technologists have also made such a dashboard available and also improved the aesthetics and accessibility for people with color blindness in our own CECC publications. So this shows that um, intersectionality is really at the core of what we in the East Asia and in our counter coronavirus strategies. So I think um, this is um, exactly at uh, 20 minutes past six. So over to the other panelists. Okay, thank you so much for the, your presentation. Um, just for, for right now, um, I'll be picking up some additional questions from the floor addressed to you because um, I have so many of them. But um, I think you pretty much covered all the questions, but there will be, let's see. Um, so you established a platform for fielding like public opinions on government policies, mm -hmm. um, breaking down uh, barriers between the government and the people. And along with that, how do you move your government officials or government to reflect the ideas of citizens to the policy? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so as I said, uh, we have many platforms uh, mm -hmm. for, for the co-hack the coronavirus or collaboration hackathon uh, invited people from many countries to work on the various ideas. And the winner gets a traditional rice cooker uh, that can be used to disinfect the mask. Well, they also get some rice. It's not just <laughs> uh, anyway, so, but the point is that all the topics here are chosen by participants from all the different countries, for example, on making smooth transition to the new world after the pandemic. And each and every suggestion gets a uh, impact assessment on human right and on uh, privacy and on so on. So if this is colored red, then we actually don't consider that. If it's colored yellow, uh, we ask the authority of that ministry to come up with a clarification or interpretation. And so people understand that this is not the time to change our constitutional protection. Uh, this is not the time to encroach on human right. These stay at the very center of the Taiwan model. So whereas group A, think that uh, we should publish a very detailed travel history. Um, group B think it's a bad idea. And we always say, no, the rough consensus should be uh, what people modify each other's proposals a little bit. And um, they say, oh, we should make a precise map, but not for confirmed cases, but rather for supplies, critical supplies to the community and so on. And that everybody agrees. So using uh, technologies such as POLIS, we have been able to discover new ways of making uh, partnerships based on reliable data. And every time that we run the police conversation like this, where people see each other's idea, they can click agree or disagree. When they do, they move toward the people who share similar thoughts. Um, there's no reply button, so there's no troll. Uh, so basically, everybody end up seeing this picture which is about maybe five very controversial statements that we agree to disagree, but there's like a lot of um, consensual ideas and we have not yet implemented. So why don't we focus our energy on these things? And so using pro-social media that is designed specifically to make democracy work better is better than trying to work with anti-social media. And when the public service see that the people really have a lot of very good ideas, of course they're happy um, to partner with the civil society because for the government, uh, having a true uh, liberal democracy is to have people be backing good ideas so our Central Epidemic Command Center's commander actually always say to each new idea, oh, you should probably teach me that, um, how to do it. You should have told me long ago, uh, let's learn it together and so on. And even our uh, vice president at the time, um, Dr. Chen Jianren, who literally wrote the textbook on epidemiology, he also <laughs> had a very humble attitude and recorded a crash course on epidemiology on YouTube. So if you go to Taiwan Can Help That Us, as I showed in the last slide, you can actually learn about the coronavirus from Dr. Chen Jianren, the academician and top epidemiologist. And this is important mm -hmm. because he shows the humbleness of uh, he shares what he knows, he invites people to indicate their knowledge, and even the people who have not yet uh, collected their mask, they can allocate their uncollected quota uh, through an online app. So there's more than 600,000 people, half of which publish their name. Um, just at this uh, day, uh, the dedication exceeds 5 mil million masks for the first time today. Uh, and so <laughs> a lot of things to the international community. And you can see all the name here. Of course, uh, this is also open data under open license. So it can be visualized any other way. So if you say for, for my name, like Tang Feng, which is my name, you can see that I dedicated uh, well, not really 36, I dedicated six masks, but people with Tang Feng in their name uh, also oh, okay. <laughs> dedicated 36 masks. So this is like a badge of honor that people can say that uh, it's not mm -hmm. the government donating, it's the Taiwanese citizen, and you can pinpoint uh, all the names of the people who choose to reveal their name. Oh, okay. That's really impressive that you are actually releasing all the information related to the public's Tira. Um, um, so uh, we have also another questions that, uh, yeah, it's with the like a climate change, actually. And um, what aspects of Taiwan water, especially spreading humor and the sense of like humor that you have used, can be applied to the climate change movement strategy? Do you have any idea? Yeah, on very much so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. For example, the um, idea of a, a civil IoT system of which Dr. Feng Ximin, uh can uh, explain uh, later, mm -hmm. is the expert on that, basically mm -hmm. invites everybody to participate in the data collection and curation. 
if only a few people like environmental activists care about the environment, the general population feel it's maybe like two generations in the future, they don't care about it, right? But if people uh, collect the data by themselves, dedicating, for example, their balconies or their schools uh, to the collection of environmental data, then all the uh, you know, primary school students learn that uh, all of this is need to uh, be taken care of by the entire population. And when they see that international counterparts also participate in education for sustainable development, their motivation increases mm -hmm. because the data models that they contribute, even if they're just a high schooler for a science fair or something, uh, they can make a real impact to the global climate science. So making it ex accessible, especially to the juniors, uh, is what we have found as most effective because the young people, they are at the uh, at the business end of climate change, okay. <laughs> and so they are they are very active and see the right, right. of sustainability as something of utmost importance, and they will then motivate the more senior people to uh, move them into action. Oh, okay, it's really impressive, like how you have brought youth actually to the like, all the project that you do. Um, and that's all. Um, let, um, why don't you just talk about a little bit on the future? Um, well, we are still combating COVID-19, but we will be returning to what we call new normal, where virus prevention measures become like a part of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And that makes us to be all ready for what we call post-COVID-19 era. Mm -hmm. So like a companies were um, being forced to embrace remote working. Um, and then schools closure have led to online classes. And there will be like a, some new uh, business area poised for strong years in the post COVID 19 and how do you see post COVID 19 era in taiwan and can you share some of the projects and thoughts that you are preparing for it yeah definitely even oh, though sure. in taiwan we have had no uh lockdowns in schools and mm -hmm. therefore no need for remote education nevertheless we have found that uh if you uh, meet each other there's we never banned uh, meeting each other uh, for education purpose but of course if you are very dense you have to wear a mask <laughs> and you cannot really see whether i'm smiling or not if i'm wearing a mask so people prefer telecommunication because you can see each other more, clearly, right. <laughs> more than anything uh, and so that is uh, the new normal we have many different like satellite classes and people sit uh, in a less dense manner or, or with plastic shielding between them. And each room is maybe 20 people or so. Mm -hmm. And then we use the telecommunication strategy to communicate through all the municipality to connect them together into a large room virtually. And this has been the norm for me. I've been touring around Taiwan to the mm -hmm. least connected places to sit there with the local co-ops and not-for-profit workers for years now. And I connect them sometimes with the help of the translators for indigenous um, coaches uh, into the municipalities in the central um, uh, governments. And the point here is that it is bringing the decision making to where the people are. This is about empowering the people who are furthest away from the decision makers. And we intend to continue doing that so much so that our 5G strategy focus on setting up 5G connectivity to the places that have the weakest 4G signal. So basically, we're saying that um, we are all in this together. The most remote places need to enjoy the first in uh, telehealth, uh, in uh, remote education, because we don't want to leave anyone behind and they need it rather than just want it. And that, I think, is the same strategy as um, the South Korea and Japanese government. And we're all in this together uh, for sustainability. Okay, thank you so much for the sharing your thoughts on the post-COVID-19 era. Um, I think because of the time, I think this would be very last questions addressed to you. Okay. Um, uh, I think um, you've seen um, other policies or projects that was done in other countries responding to COVID-19. And was there any project that you'd like to bring into Taiwan that you haven't had one in yet? No, we're, we're very quick at adapting. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, countries, uh, ideas and technology, uh, we, we learned really, we learned from the best. Uh, and uh, when there is uh, new innovations, the scientific community moves really quickly to bring them into the fold so that uh, the rapid testing vaccination, uh, we already imported remdesivir and so on, they're uh, really uh, quick. Uh, what we are trying to um, offer, uh, I would say using the last uh, minute, uh, is not just those medical dedications. If you receive the mask and you like it, we're also exporting the entire factory. 
uh, you just provide us with a parcel of land and water uh, and electricity, and our medical mass producers will help you setting up something uh, that like a micro factory that can churn out two million masks a day, uh, 24 hours a day, and you can repurpose it to do N95 or R95 or whatever, and still have some leftover material for using uh, it for protective gear and so on. So this is basically uh, we providing the first taste of what the quality of Made in Taiwan looks like. And we're really happy to share these in an open innovation way, not in a kind of colonizing or making you depending on us. We don't do that. This is entirely open innovation. Uh, okay, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And I really um, um, hope that there will be more collaborative um, actions together that we can do in the future. And thank you so much for joining tonight with us, Audrey. It was a great honor to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank have a you. good time. Stay safe. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. So now I will be moving to the next session where a representative of Japan, Korea, and Taiwan will share its cases responding to COVID-19. Um, so uh, we would like, like to have Hal Seki from Japan to the floor. And Hal Seki is a DX fellow for Tokyo Metropolitan Government. And he's also founder of Code for Japan. And he would like to share next generation government website by open source and open data. And just quick reminder for the viewers, um, you can just leave your questions in live chat in YouTube that you are watching right now. Or you may also find us in Twitter, hashtag AODP2020. And you may also leave your questions to Slido. Event code is 97698. And all the detailed information is down in the YouTube you are watching right now. So virtually over to Mr. Hal Seki. The floor is all yours. Hello. Can I share the screen now? OK. So uh, hello, I'm Haru Seki. Thank you for giving me a great opportun opportunity to share an experience from Japanese and open data and open source utilization. I'm very happy to be here uh, to uh, share uh, the, what's happening in Japan. And uh, Audrey, uh, I'm very uh, happy to be here with uh, Audrey and Mr. Lee because the uh, Taiwanese and Korean and Japanese civic tech communities are very close friends. Each country's civic hackers have been collaborating together many years. So, uh, I'm a founder of Code for Japan. This is the top page of our website. Uh, it says that we make the future that we want to see. Every people have a power to, to change the society. We will think and create future together. It's fun. Uh, one of our top page photos fe features Audrey. We took this photo before she became famous in Japan, by the way. So uh, let me start from the COVID-19 status in Japan. Uh, the total number of deaths from the coronavirus is, is uh, nine, 900. The Japanese government announced a state of emergency for the main, for the main seven prefectures on April 7th, which was followed by the nationwide spread of, on uh, April 16th. And the state of emergency was lifted for the 33 per prefectures on May 14th and for the entire country on May 25th. After the state of emergency was lifted, the number of new infections has fallen below 100. However, uh, there is a, a cluster uh, outbreak in Kitakyushu city. The city had not been infected for more than three weeks. So we cannot be too careful yet. People are starting the economic activity with the fear of uh, re-expansion of coronaviruses. Today, I'm going to tell you how to Tokyo Metropolitan Government has used open data and open source to visualize information about the coronaviruses. This screenshot shows the anti-coronaviruses site that launched in early March. Based on the graph, you can see that uh, you can understand easily to, of the uh, number of tested cases or a number of confirmed cases, uh, hospitalized or uh, recovered, and so on. This site was developed 
by the Code for Japan in response to the request from the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Also, Tokyo Metropolitan Government released the same data as an open data on their data catalog. This, the site was uh, gained a reputation for being easy to understand. And at, at one point in the in, in time, uh, sorry, uh, at, at one one point in time, it was viewed over a million pa million page per day. But the main topic is not the not this. We published the source code of this website on the GitHub. Uh, so you, as you can see, the uh, everyone can uh, clone uh, our website and contribute to the uh, to the to improve the uh, website. And the the Tokyo Metropolitan uh, Government uh, allows the people to contribute to modify the website. This is the uh, this was the very uh, new way to to how to uh, build the website. Even the uh, repository was the ranked top ten of the GitHub Global Trend Repository. This is, uh, 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 you, you, as you can see, the, uh, the, through the uh, website, the, more than the, uh, 1,300 people uh, forked our website and used for, some, uh, for the, their, uh, put their purpose. The, we also uh, add the MIT license on the source code, which means uh, everyone can uh, copy and use and modify uh, freely without the permission. Then we received so many contributors from the world. Just in the three weeks, we've got uh, 750 issues. Then we solved uh, 671 issues by more than 200 contributors, which was amazing, right? Uh, I've been working with, as a computer engineer for over 20 years, but uh, uh, I've never experienced anything like this before. People were excited to contribute to the repository. Even as she said earlier, uh, Audrey sent a pull request. Uh, thank you very much. I remember that, remember that the, the, the Com committers got very excited at the time they found this request. Of course, we adapted this pull request immediately. This kind of collaboration would not have been possible if we built a website the closed way that our pioneer minister to help the web Tokyo Metropolitan Government website, which is cool, right? Then the other communities and governments started to launch their website using the source code. The, these pictures are my most favorite site images of those, very unique. And that, that these neat images uh, attracted the younger generation to contributing. In the end, every single prefecture launched the COVID-19 response website. Some of these are operated by the student communities, and some of them are as operated as an official government website. However, it's not always a good thing. On the other hand, uh, there was also a summary, summary issue. I guess many of people who have been working with open data would know this program. Can you guess? Yes, PDF. Many of P prefixtures uh, published their data only PDF format. Also, data structure was different so that community had to copy the data manually or scrape the data from the website. Uh, it required many manual effort. Sometimes the data updates were slow and even the U URL was changed. That was the issues we had to solve. Had to solve. So, uh, Code for Japan asked the help of VLET, the uh, organization which is uh, organizing this uh, event uh, in in Japan, and the 
to create a standard format. To format based on Tokyo's data format and worked with the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications in Japan to create guidelines for other municipalities. These guidelines have been very helpful to, to the community in negotiating with their municipalities. Some of them agreed to publish the data as a standard format. It let me, the community, to automate the website updating. And I would emphasize this. At the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, uh, many of the government staffs worked hard to make the data easy to use without sparing time for sleep. It was an extraordinary effort to compile the data collected from various departments every day, uh, compile it into open data and release it into the public. This time, they made an environment to uh, output these data from each department's Excel file uh, via uh, Microsoft SharePoint server. The images on the right is an uh, article about the behind the scene of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government website. I like it because uh, it shows a cool photo of the city staff. So we have to respect the uh, people inside the uh, government. Well, that was the story of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government website. Uh, I believe that the public services should be created with the citizens because we know what is the issues and what public services should look, should be looked like. Can you imagine? If the each local government shared their source, uh, services source code publicly and receive contributions from public, it will create a huge open source community. The Tokyo case, Tokyo's case shows an a possibility of such an uh, ecosystem. A uh, famous open source developer, Paul Ramsey, says that investment in open source technology will create the intellectual capital. I think rather than taxes being spent as the intellectual property of the particular vendor, it becomes an intellectual capital that everyone in society can use, which will lower than cost in the long run. For example, a lot of technical articles were published by the citizen contributors. The Tokyo website has uh, become a living textbook of learning civic tech and public contributions. What feels most hopeful to me is that high school and university students also played a big role in community of this COVID-19 website without uh, website. Without their contributions, the website might not be uh, this huge uh, success. We had an, we had a seminar with the younger generations so, uh, uh, um, a few days ago. They moved me very much. They wanted to use their skills of programming to create something good and felt satisfactions to make uh, our society a better place. Or enjoying to make a friend who is able to discuss technology topics. This is the future of civic tech, I think. Okay, uh, this is my last word. Uh, Creating opportunities for dialogue and co-creation will increase the value of using open data. Only uh, providing the data is not enough. Please do open the governance, open source, and let them to contribute. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. And I feel like that it's the very first case that you have established like an official website with the participation of civic hackers. And that was mm -hmm. really impressive one. Um, um, I have uh, some questions from the Slido as well for you. Okay. 
Um, since you have mentioned like the most difficult one was um, creating the data in the PDF format. So, <laughs> and then I think the question um, like was asked by civic hackers that mm -hmm. like uh, he's saying that like uh, perhaps like the government officials are not that familiar with the requirements of the code. So perhaps mm -hmm. would, like uh, educating government officials of Japan would mm -hmm. help them to like uh, release the data format in the CSV or open open format. Okay. The uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. So yes, the data is uh, making the good data is a very uh, big problem, and it it's difficult to understand uh, for uh, the, some of the people who is not have uh, who have not uh, the knowledge about the, this kind of uh, data things. So uh, Code for Japan have been organizing organizing the uh, workshops for the city officials, which is called. Uh, data Academy, and actually we had uh, uh, more. Uh, we provided the that kind of workshops for more than uh, I think more than uh, forty local government, and so that kind of uh, uh, regular learning uh, is really important. And to actually, actually, Tokyo government, Tokyo Metropolitan government uh, have hired such tech person uh, as a city officials last year. And, and such people uh, worked with uh, local government uh, uh, people and, 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 and the people uh, made the, uh, this kind of environment for this time. So yeah, oh. learning uh, opportunities and uh, uh, hiring people is important, I think. Oh, okay, so like the Tokyo government um, is also hiring like uh, technical persons as well, and you are also mm -hmm. like uh, uh, operating a number of workshops with the government officials. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, yes. Uh, then um, I believe like you are a representative of civic hackers, but while you are mm -hmm. also working for the government at yeah. the same time, <laughs> and uh, what do yeah. you think is the most effective way for you to like uh, balance those two? What is the most effective like communicating between two? Mm -hmm. oh. I think working together is most important. So we, I, I am not uh, talking with the people with the uh, with the name of organization. Just go to the the people who have been working for some something to good and uh, ask the what what are you doing and what is the program. And after that, make something, uh, prototypes for them or with them. So, and let them to, to learn the new things. That, that kind of the ordinary conversation is really important. The innovation is not uh, only built by the techn techn technical way. So we, you need to gain, you need to make trust with the people who are actually working on that program. So, yeah, so I actually I have many hats <laughs> <laughs> other, other than Code for Japan and the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'll be just meeting you back at the panel discussion with additional mm -hmm. um, questions that I have for you. So thank you so much for your presentation and then I'll be meeting you back at the panel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, uh, now I would like to invite um, another representative from Korea. And just once again, for the reminder, um, we'll be taking tech questions um, addressed to any of speakers from multiple channels. So you may leave your questions to live chat section in YouTube that you are watching right now. Also, um, you may find us in Twitter, hashtag AODP2020, and you can leave your questions to Slido. The event code is 97698. And now um, I'd like to invite a representative from Korea, Han Jung Lee. He is the Vice President of the Department of Open Data in National Information Society Agency. And he will give us Korea's response to COVID-19 by utilization and release of open data. So virtually, over to you, Mr. Lee. The floor is all yours. 
Thank you. Good evening, uh, Hawk Celosi, a Britain Thailand Digital Minister, Jimin Pong from Taiwan, Haseki from Japan. And for those who have virtually joined tonight for the webinar, it is a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, I am Han Jung Lee. Uh, I would like to thank you all for hosting this webinar and giving me the chance to share Korean's experience tonight. As we all know, a number of countries are exerting much effort fighting against COVID-19. In this context, I would like to give a presentation on how Korea has responded to pandemic uh, COVID-19 using open government data. These are contents of my presentation today. I'll be talking about the current status of COVID-19 in Korea first. Then we will share how Korea has responded to using open data, actual case of a PPP, and would like to share lessons that we have learned. First, current situation of COVID-19 in Korea. Mm, this is timeline for COVID-19 status in Korea. Uh, looking at the graph along the outbreak of a confirmed um, patient, Government of Korea has taken a number of decisive policies to contain virus so far. As you see, policies related to ICT uh, highlighted in color orange in this slide. Uh, as we go from the beginning uh, on January 8th this year, a very first case of a person with symptoms have been occurred. Accordingly, uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevent uh, has established the COVID-19 micro web page on February 5th, 2020 to provide all related information about COVID-19 to citizens. Mm, I'll be discussing this web page in detail later on. Then you see the maximum number of confirmed uh, patient reach a peak of 1062 on March 1st, and government of Korea has started drive through screening centers um, as the first in the world. On March 3rd, the policy to facilitate the supply and demand of masks has been implemented to reduce the total turmoil. Uh, launch of a self-quantity app and mask service were followed by um, the number of daily new cases reached a peak of 1062 on March 1st and uh, 21 cases on May 21. We are having fewer than uh, 20 new patients per day where we managed to plant the curb amid the stringent quantity, uh, uh, quarantine and social distancing measures. However, uh, as the number of patients is increasing sporadically, the uh, quarantine policy is gradually uh, strengthening. Uh, next, uh, now, I do, uh, now I would like to share how government of Korea has responded to COVID-19 using open data. Uh, this micro page opened on uh, February 5th that I mentioned earlier in the slide is providing overall status of COVID-19 in Korea, uh, daily briefing of government, fact check for the fake news, and guideline for related institutions accordingly. You see, this web page provides data visualization of accumulated case for new, tested, isolated, and released from isolation as well. And also providing information of, uh, on movement paths of a confirmed uh, patient regional status and international cases. All-day briefing by central and local government and the press release have been uploaded daily. We also provide all information on policy of damage support caused by COVID-19 for different groups of citizens, vulnerable social groups, SMEs, medical institutions as well. All this information is also available in English and Chinese for foreigners. Important part in here is that key information of a micro page has been released as of data for it views through our national data portal as a CSV format. You may all find a number of data related to COVID-19 in Korea data portal. Government of Korea has been releasing data produced by ministry and public institutions as issue data via data portal. 
for private sector to develop related services accordingly by utilization and analysis of data. By categorizing data that will release by a portal into four areas, which are overview status, masks, public welfare support, and daily life. Data sets of uh, overview status of COVID-19 include uh, regional status of COVID-19 segmented by area, age, and sex. Additionally, data sets of screening centers and the national security hospital are also provided in the portal. Just for your information, National Security Hospital is that uh, separates the treatment of uh, respiratory and non-respiratory patients to prevent infection in the hospital. Mask data is provided to service developers through API by segmenting information of mask sellers and inventory status. I will be discussing this in detail in next slide. Public welfare support data is also provided in the portal. These data provide a comprehensive summary about the uh, economic support for citizens and business who have been strongly affected by COVID-19. Daily life data provide useful information to people who have been affected daily, such as uh, uh, studying due to movement restriction. Data sets include e-learning uh, content, uh, publicly open courses uh, of uh, university, lifelong education courses, safety information of uh, countries, and agricultural products that may be in its immunity. Uh, it is a crucial role for government to provide the information as data, then private use and utilize the data to develop to useful service for citizens quickly. Uh, in this page, I'll be explaining the outline of the mask map service developed by Korea. Health Insurance Review and Assessment Service, uh, known as HERA, uh, well deals with the national health insurance system in Korea, relays mask sales data, which contains code of mask sellers, uh, quantity of warehousing, number of mask sales to national information society agents. Uh, then NIA repackages the data with adding inventory segmentation with displaying mask availability using four different colors and address-based latitude and longitude coordinate conversion. Then provide it as open API format by a neighbor cloud. The neighbor is the largest search engine in Korea. Uh, in here, uh, national cloud business such as KT, Coscom, NHN, NBP provide data API servers and development environment for programming for stable service to run. This is to solve traffic problems that might have caused due to public greater attention private portal such as Naver, Kakao, and with the CB hackers, startups, and the community of engineers, private sector were able to develop a variety of mask services so quickly by API uh, that we have provided. So about 150 apps uh, and web services developed so far. Mm. This is a successful uh, public-private partnership PPP case uh, where all stakeholders have participated from the very beginning stage. Uh, thus, uh, we're able to fully leverage the capacity and professional solution that private sector has. In this context, I would like to uh, elaborate more on actual case of PPP. Before jumping into the case, I would like to touch a little bit on the role of a public sector in partnership. Uh, these are more of a works that the public sectors, especially NIA, where I work has implemented so far, which enable us to provide light open government data in right time. First, we have been established the collaborating process within government body. Uh, since 2015, uh, we have set a 96 field as national core data, which are high demand, high value to the industry, then release them by a portal. Through this uh, systematic process of data release, they have been established in Korea. Also, central government and the ministry have human resources 
whose tasks are assigned to data only. And we have a very organized community of them, and they have built a very close networking online and offline as well. Organized community of government officials was very highly effective way of communicating and collaborating in this unexpected crisis. And second, uh, we are collaborating with the citizen and business as well. Since 2017, we have been operating open data forum, which is communicated platform with the citizen. And since 2018, we have been implementing joint project for supporting business, where we support for people who want to start data related business. And we also uh, exert much effort in creating open community for overall open data environment. Last, uh, we have been supporting stable IT infrastructure prepared for release and share of open government data. Uh, through data portals, uh, we release the open data in the format of API to enable immediate and convenient use. In addition, in the implementation of the mask map service, inauguration and operation consultative body of local cloud business named PASTA. Uh, was uh, very helpful is a systematic realization uh, where we were greatly supported. Uh, I would like to share the actual case by private sector using open government data responding to COVID-19. This is an example of a mask map service and uh, it is a similar form that offered by other countries. Uh, in Korea, we share public masks through pharmacy, post office, and Hanaro Mart. We match their information of sales and location, provide them to the private sectors as API format. Uh, private service providers mark this onto a map. It is shown as color, green, yellow, red, and gray, depending on the sales quantity and circumstance of a sales place. Uh, other countries may have had a similar experience, but uh, initially there was an upsurge in uh, price due to absolute lack of supply, long queue for purchase, and the burden of additional work to the seller. However, since the launch of the mask map service, uh, issue and problems had gradually stabilized, reducing civil compliance from both citizens and sellers. Uh, in this slide, uh, I would like to introduce other services developed by private sector using open government data. This self-diagnosis app is developed by private sector using symptom data of COVID-19 confirmed patients. Uh, this app presents uh, patients' uh, severity based on basic information, symptoms, medical history that users put in app. App tells users if he or she has to be screened for testing. It was very effective in reducing the unnecessary test uh, request and checking for infection by simply providing information to citizens who were anxious with a fear of COVID-19. Another one is that use data of uh, screening centers and national security hospitals. As I mentioned before, uh, the screening centers are placed where citizens get tested for COVID-19 and the National Security Hospital are the manage uh, respiratory patients uh, separately to contain virus from spreading. Government has provided the list of screening centers and the National Security Hospital daily in CSV format, then developers mark this data on the map with the information they already have. The following is an example of a citizen's voluntary use of, of data. Uh, the first one is the data set unloaded to Kaggle. By using COVID-19 patient data from Centers for Disease Control and Prevent, private experts have repacked the data with uh, adding geography information and infection tests. This data set is available on Kaggle for AI research. Uh, the following is the app providing information on movement paths of a confirmed uh, patient. This is a service that enables users to check movement paths of the confirmed and displaying the information on the map. Now, I would like to wrap up my presentation by sharing lessons that I have learned. 
responding over COVID-19, I realized the, the importance of real, uh, releasing open government data and cooperation with the citizen and private. Let me tell you what I have heard in part. Uh, the first one is uh, the importance of a cooperation. When the mask supply was in great summer, the public, private, and business have all gathered to find better solution and discuss in real time through SNS. Uh, through this, we were able to launch a mask map service faster. The government actually has made a very good example of a case where it's a government who released the data and it's the private sector who developed related service. The second one is uh, the expansion of citizen developers' participation, uh, voluntary participation of citizens were stood out in the release of open data related to COVID-19. It was a citizen who voluntarily repackaged the data and uh, launched the service on national issues. I think it is very important that for government to release high quality data in right time whenever citizens need and maximize the effectiveness of open government data. The third one is uh, the need for the stable IT infrastructure. Korea has established high speed infrastructure and cloud service. Uh, well established as well, I think. Open government data provides on well established IT infrastructure citizens can enjoy its advantage. Uh, in preparation for on, on push data the epidemic, uh, we all did a uh, stable and high performance in I, uh, IT, IT infrastructure to continue living as untacked with including inering. In Korea, uh, advanced IT infrastructures such as online education system and teleconferencing have played a pivotal role. Last, uh, I personally think we need a constant digital collaboration platform that can collect, analyze, and release the needed data in order to respond in advance against a number of the disasters in the country and implement it through public private. Uh, cooperation. Oh, that's all for today's presentation. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, I would like to thank you all for once again for having me tonight, and I hope there would be more opportunities for collaboration. I will be pleasure to take any question on my presentation. Mm, there will be uh, substantial interpretation for better delivery of materials. Thank you very much for your understanding. Thank you very much for the, your presentation. And I'll be picking up some questions from the floor as well. And as you mentioned before, then there will be a sequential interpretations. Um, OK, uh, let me start with this one, um, that efforts of governments were mainly focused on releasing open data to national portal that you have mentioned. And do you have any new data sets to release in the Korean data portal in the future? And do you also think that releasing data would be enough in the upcoming the future for promoting another form of public-private partnership? Uh, thank you. I think that is a very good question. Uh, I would not say that the government open data releasing is a perfect way for collaboration uh, with the private sector and the third sector, but open government data initiative can play a key role in promoting partnership with them. In particular, Korean government has a special experience for public service delivery under new circumstances uh, in the process of supporting to develop mask application and web service. Uh, this means the government released data set on the central open data portal in response to users' uh, request, and the private sector used it for developing mask applications. Uh, by doing this, we have learned the power of public-private partnership, and it will continue work on developing and implementing open government data partnership with the private sector. And as for the last questions, uh, in addition to uh, the, co the Korean government is focused on releasing open government data on public service um, related to the social and economic support uh, for public. For instance, data on freely available online university lecture, 
and economic software policy from the center and local government. And, and the mentor has counseling center uh, already published on the center of data portal and data on digital library and disinfection of public place are in the progress. Okay, thank you so much for um, the answers. And well, um, I have a lot of questions, but, but let me start with this one. Well, it seems like um, not only central government or ministry, but also local governments and municipalities have been participating in releasing open data. And do you have any strategy or framework for encourage them to release the data that they have? Uh, yes, uh, all center, all center and local governments should develop and implement of open data policy by the Open Data Act. And the President Moon announced in 2018 that all government data of public sector organization uh, would be released by 2021. According to the above mentioned legal instruments and political willingness, the local government making an effort to release their data to ensure people's right to know and relieve anxiety from COVID-19. Also, data from all local government can be collected into the central disaster and safety head counter in Korea at, at the national crisis or emergency by the Disaster and Safety Management Act. And those data are integrated in managers in the safety information management system. Mm, okay, thank you so much for the sharing. And I think because of time, this would be the last one. And there was a question regarding that, how do you reflect the um, demands of users with the quality of the data that you are releasing to the data portal? Mm. Yeah. Mm. To uh, make sure maintain and responsive open data quality, data user can engage to the open data releasing planning. And uh, as you can see, our presentations, especially the mask data releasing plan, all of the uh, civic hacker or private sector, they are participate to how to release a uh, data set and how to make it to available to make it easy to develop applications. And it is also a uh, user can provide a feedback on the open data portal in real time. So the government take the feedback and they give the results of the how it, uh, how their feedback can be uh, processed or can be fixed. They can receive, uh, they can get uh, receive a response on the open data portal as well. Mm -hmm. So Korea is like uh, more of embarrassing all the stakeholders from the very beginning. And there's also like a function in the portal that reflects the opinion of users at in real time. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for your um, questions and answers. And thank you so much for the presentation once again. And I will be inviting you the panel discussion later on. Thank you so much. And now without further ado, I would like to invite another representative Taiwan, Dr. Chimin Pong. He is the chairman of Organization for Data-Driven Application, and he would like to give us on the topic that data matters in the time of COVID-19, data use, open data, and privacy. So virtually over to you, Dr. Pong, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good evening, everyone. This is Chimin Pong. And actually, every day in this time, I'm talking about the weather. But <laughs> today and uh, over the last six months, I just like a bird, still in the bird cage. <laughs> I cannot okay. fly because I fly a lot. I hope and in the future, as soon as possible, we can meet together as especially Asia Open Data Partnership and we can discuss more detail about the future. Let's uh, show my presentation, please. And uh, today I will talk about some issues, especially how can we use the data and second, and uh, what's the open data policy and also the privacy issues. You know, uh, we have lots of, because the COVID-19, the government becomes stronger and bigger. So how can we see the open data and the privacy issue is uh, very important. The first, I will show you the trend of COVID-19, how many cases uh, from uh, April. And uh, until now, we have 51, zero case. 
and you can see some fluctuation is uh, exposed from the foreign countries. And uh, right now in Taiwan, it's quite safe. And uh, in June 7, and uh, our government announced we will co come back to the normal life. So it's very lucky for us to do. And uh, why the Taiwan is better, I will talk about later. And in the beginning, I would like to show you uh, this article is very interesting in time. In time. And uh, this is uh, Yovo No and Harari. Uh, he is a historian, not data scientist. He's a historian, or now not a, a politician. He talk about right now, all of our government, all over the world, we build a wall, restrict travel, reduce trade. However, such is kind of make the economy collapse because the long-term isolationism will lead to economy collapse. So what we do is another, the best way, uh, we can share the information the first. The first one is the scientific information. For example, uh, we have a new drugs and a new kind of the uh, way to solve the problem. The second is the, each country should honestly share information about the outbreak without fear of economy catastrophe. So it's very important we can share each kind of the data. For example, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, if we can share very closely based on the same standard, I think we can travel very soon, uh, more than the other countries. So it's very important we can extend a helping hand rather than uh, optical uh, vision. And uh, why the Taiwan can fight? I think the, our digital minister, AU, talked a lot about that. But I would like to say there were several points by my point of view. The first is uh, because Taiwan is very close to China. We monitor in there lots of the their WeChat, lots of the people uh, say something on the internet. And uh, one of our government official, he found uh, in the uh, social media, some people talking about uh, in Wuhan, they announced something. So in the in Taiwan government announced the border control very early. So it's very important and uh, Taiwan is quite safe. The second is the, our minister, uh, he is working very hard every day until now, although we are almost zero now, and uh, he still have a daily press conference every day, talk, talking to the public, talking to the people directly, how we can do, uh, should we worry something or we should not worry something. He just like uh, our grandfather talking something to keep everybody peace. And the third is uh, epidemic information is open enough. In Taiwan, you can get all of the open data just or you, you can see. And uh, I think the most important thing is uh, our national health insurance. I think it's from the big data because uh, from, uh, for example, I'm a meteorologist. I got the cold, cold data, uh, but fever data every day. For example, I can see the trend. The weather is quite cold and uh, the people, the CDC will announce the data. So it's even the same about the COVID-19. So our national health insurance help us couple with the other data together. And also the household registration, I think is also the big data. How many people there live there and uh, how can we work together? It's based on the household is very important. It's from our government ministry of interior department. And uh, the, another issue is the uh, serial tracking using the mobile phone. And uh, however, it still have some privacy issues. And uh, I will talk about that later. And also Taiwan, we also the, from the AI labs, from the uh, PPP, and they, they work with government. They design a social distance APP, but it's not a long, it's not launched until now. Uh, just so we know the Google and the Apple, they will launch the new, uh, their own social distance APP in the future. And another is a mask rationing plan. It's very important to Taiwan. Uh, everybody can get a lot of the mask by themselves. Although uh, right now it's, it's enough, we can export to, the, to other countries. And uh, another big issue is the bailout benefit. After the, because the economic crack, crash every, in every region. Today our government announced if you pay Three hundred Taiwanese dollars is almost uh, one hundred U.S. dollars. You can get two hundred, uh, just like another uh, relief package. But it's pay. Not, it's traditional. It's paid by cash. But this year, we our government want to promote the payment mobile payment. So they use another way called uh, we give you three hundred, three thousand. You can get two thousand. 
So it's very interesting. And however, we can calculate, we can argue with the government, this is better or not, because uh, everybody wants to see the, the benefit from the bailout. So our government use lots of ways to uh, want to uh, help boost consumption in this, uh, uh, in this time. So it's the bailout benefit, how to calculate its work or not is very important. And sometimes we will argue, we will discuss with our government about that. But it's very healthy to talk about the issues, which way is the better one. So right now our government, they, they use the coupon or vouchers to help boost the consumption. It's very uh, interesting case in Taiwan. And uh, another issue is the climate change. You know, uh, because the COVID-19 in China, every country and every all of the world, because we are frozen in our house. So our, our right now, the air pollution is very is reduced. Air quality is quite good. However, uh, the way forward, should we change to go back to the normal life, still use the traditional fossil fuel, or we should use another green way? That's about the country talking about that. Because, uh, you know, uh, although this year, our economy, because of the COVID-19, our economy collapsed. However, the, this is the first year our all of the war will reach the Paris Agreement. It's a, a climate change deal. And however, this year will reach the, the goal. But I think it's just one year. So right now is a, is, a, is, a, is a good time to choose. We will go back to the normal way, or the left side or the right side, a way to forward, to make it green, to help the, the earth. So right now in European country, I don't know the other country, what you can do, Japan or Korea. Maybe you can talk to, talk, tell us later. Right now, our government, they will choose some uh, little green, but not so, so, so green. And uh, but some, in some country, especially in European Union, they use the uh, strong green stimulus to help the, the economy go to green. But some countries still rebound to fossil fuel. So it's very important. How can we do in the future? If we have more data, we can discuss with government. How can we do in the future? It's very better, uh, especially the post-COVID-19 response. I think it's, it's an impact on emission in 2030. Right now, is, this year is 2020. However, 2030 is very close to our climate change deal. And uh, another issue is uh, data becomes political issues. I think recently, because a lot of the country were open to the others because the economy need the people travel. So how to balance economy and the health concern of reopening economies is very important. And, uh, but however, I think some governments will cherry picking <laughs> the good data to justify their decision to reopen. So right now, I think uh, for our open data communities, we should discuss about such a kind of issue based on the same standard about the data, not cherry picking, or we will have another pick maybe in, in October or later. And uh, so how to, the, how to open the metadata and the transparency in data reporting are more important than ever. And another issue is the privacy I mentioned to you because uh, our government, I, I remember one day our government announced they, you, they will use the mobile phone. The, the first things I would think uh, is uh, the, probably the government will monitor me. But I think because right now it's COVID-19, it's okay. But what's the after the COVID-19, the government won't such this kind of tool. They were monitoring our, our, our people. So we will lose our digital rights. So such is kind of emergency action uh, derogating from the national rules or law. Could, could, could it translate into mass surveillance tools? So that, that's how we concern. So I remember uh, I, I was invited to government high-level meeting. They introduced the social distance APP. So lots of people talking about probably we should follow the GDPR. The GDPR, the GDPR, especially the European Data Protection Board, they announced a guideline about how can we use the location data and the contact track tracing tools. Is any rule about that? So it's very important that the government should involve the relevant civil society organization. In this case, those concerned with privacy, data protection, and the digital right. I think it's very important. So we push the government, we should have a, 
expert to review all of the source code uh, about the app, app and uh, and they should promise they cannot storage store the data in their server just in in our, our mobile phone so it's very important about the digital rights and uh, so my conclusion will be uh, we should rethink rethinking the data matter in the post covid 19 i think uh, before we can open for each other, we can have, have another LDP meetings. We should think about how can we use, because uh, it's not COVID-19, probably in the future we will have COVID-21, 22, probably. And however, we should think about the data use, open data, because of COVID-19, and also the most important and the privacy issues. And I think in the future, we should have a platform and uh, for example, Korea, you, you are very successful to you have a very PPP, the government open all the data, such a kind of source code. Probably we can use your source code in Taiwan. We also have our source code. We can share each other. We can share the information ex experience. So in the future, I think Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, we can be a, a open country and we can travel very safe in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for the, your presentation, which was really impressive that you've like tackled all the issues that might have caused. And um, I have some questions for you from the floor. It's like a Taiwan, Japan, and Korea to share information and data. And what do you think would be the most um, effective way for us to communicate efficiently? Please, please. Yeah, oh, please. okay, okay. There was some technical issues, and then I will just um, go over with the questions once again. Okay. Um, that you have mentioned in your presentation from the very beginning that there should be a platform for us, like Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, to share information and data. And what would be the like a best way of the platform that you think of would work more efficiently? I think uh, we should, uh, uh, for example, uh, we have our social distance app. But uh, they mm -hmm. claim probably the server was in just in Taiwan, and uh, we dialogue with the government. We should follow the GDPR to protect our privacy. So such is kind of meeting and also our dialogue. I think we should open to all of you because we follow the rules. Because uh, lots of people concerned, lots of people say the government will watch me, will watch me. So everybody worry about the the mobile location based data. The government will monitor us in the future. So what we act for the private sector or the government, how they work with the private sector or the public uh, society, it's very important to share the information. So probably I I, I recommend probably we should have a maybe hashtag Twitter or some press uh, to share the information. I think it's very important. Mm, okay. Thank you so much for your answer. And we have also a question regarding the weather. I know you are a great expert <laughs> in the weather. And how um I think you pretty much um tackled in the issue about how epidemic affect the weather condition or and then does it really slow the global warming, do you think? I think the COVID nineteen is very good for the climate change. <laughs> very good. But the, yes, right. the the issue is the economic collapse. You know, we, we can we can right. know if we can reach the climate change goal, and uh, we will uh, gut the economy collapse. <laughs> so we can calculate how much money. I think I think some people told me, uh, Dr. Pong, the COVID nineteen is the Earth's protection for Earth's life <laughs> because the Earth oh. will be better. And however, I think right now, uh, uh, this year, all, although we reach the goal, but I think it's a short term. In the long term, right now, I did not see too many green stimulate things about each country, they are bail out uh, uh, the policy. So right now, it's a traditional way. I think, I think it's not easy to educate the government, higher level official, you should go to the green way. So, but we, we can share the information in the future. Yeah, we can just start sharing the information from the very beginning and then we can just um, ultimately um, achieve the goals for the green um, environment as well. Um, so, okay, the time has uh, has been up. So now um, I would like to kick off our panel discussions for the more detailed information. So now um, I would like to invite our speakers once again to the floor. 
And we actually have a new representative from Korea, um, Song Bae Cho. He is an executive principal from National Information Society Agency. So welcome once again all for the panels. Um, and oh, just why don't we just start with the comments or any thoughts of our other countries' presentation that were delivered and share if there mm -hmm. were any policies or projects um, that you'd like to bring into your country for the benchmark. So like just mm -hmm. quick summary of the presentation for the viewers who just got in. So in Japan, like a Hal Seki, um, he shared he, how he has mm -hmm. motivated civic hackers and even university students in establishing official web page for the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, which is really impressive. Mm -hmm. And in Korea, key highlights were the like, releasing open data of COVID-19 studies and list of screening centers and national security hospitals and even supply of the mask to the national poor were pillars of South Korea's highly successful strategy to contain COVID-19. So it basically led, led private driven applications to be developed so quickly. And Audrey and Dr. Chi Ming Pong um, shared the like, cases of Taiwan fully leveraging the digital platform, like where multi stakeholders have been participated did it by starting digital collaborative for my mask sales and policy making as well. So um, why don't you just um, freely share all the opinions um, with the uh, other presenters? And um, let me start with the new guest from Korea, Mr. Cho. Uh, good evening. This is Song Bae Cho of National Information Society Agency. Who is time fast? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I am honored to present as a panel in webinar. Uh, in March, I participated in the task of releasing the mask data to open data quarter. Um, to be honest, it was really hard time, but I felt so proud when time passed by. Uh, I'm pleased to share the experience I had tonight with you all. I enjoyed all presentation delivered earlier. <laughs> Among them, uh, Audrey Tang, Taiwan Digital Minister, mentioned the data collaboration and I found it very impressive. Especially um, in Taiwan, citizens directly measure air quality, uh, then register data and trade the data and with, with the government. In other words, Citizen IoT is well established. I think it is worth trying in Korea as well that brings citizen into releasing part of the data, not by the government alone. In Korea, it's a similar case, I think. Uh, in some regions, data such as um, data, data of uh, toilet location for disabled uh, collected through volunteer work. Volunteers actually go the actual place and actually check the exact location. In this context, we can develop this idea into implementation somehow related to case of Taiwan. That's all for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Um, Joe, for sharing your thoughts and any comments or thoughts um, to Dr. Pong? Yeah, actually, uh, you know, it's not easy way to open the data from the government, uh, open the government data, also the private sector, also the community working together, especially the civil society. But I, I think it's a long way, step by step. So, for example, recently this year we organized our OGP OGP steering committee from the private sector. We work together and uh, organize uh, uh, all of the people, including the government, civil society, private sector, working together. So it's step by step. And however, uh, how to educate the society, use the data, uh, we can have a better data governance is uh, very important. Things mm. so recently, uh, for 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 example, me, I would like to write a lot of article to the newspaper to educate the people. We should use the data to communicate, not the, the political power to domi dominate everything. Use the data. So I think the data, open the data, use the data, should be a culture. And the culture concept is in the, the in the beginning, the first things, and the second is the the policy and the environment. So how to make a good ecosystem is very important. 
but we still need uh, some regulations, so some uh, pop, uh, pop policy for, for that. So I think, but however, I, I still think uh, the Korea or Japan, you have a very good system. We should learn each other. Right, right. Uh, so what about um, Haoseki? Do you have any comments mm -hmm. or thoughts? Yeah, I yeah, Audrey always uh, uh, give uh, give me a very uh, clear uh, philosophy to how how the society uh, should be, and yeah. I was really impressed that uh, how Taiwanese government created the trust with the right. uh, citizens. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I totally agree. The uh, innovation needs trust. Not the technology things. Making trust before uh, doing, uh, mm, making some uh, techn technology uh, things. And also, uh, she mentioned uh, that uh, you have to begin from maximum inclusion. O often we, we want to make first prototypes and target it to the uh, the tech people because they they are uh, easy to connect, but uh, with the uh, uh, kind of uh, yeah with the the many uh, uh, efforts like uh, mm -hmm. a participation officer uh, and the Taiwan Taiwan government who wants to uh, be inclusive. That was a really important takeaway from the, her presentation, and uh, I, I'd like to bring the idea about the police police uh, the, the the discussion platform she oh. mentioned policy? the yeah police yes. yeah i i i think it's also really important to cultivate the uh, kind of good uh, discussion not just arguing uh, so in japan many of people are um, have getting mad and uh, attack the people uh, with uh, Twitter or uh, social media. But uh, we need that, that kind of uh, platform to uh, have a positive discussion. So I want to bring that idea to, the, to Japan. And also Korean case and from Mr. Lee's talk. And I was uh, impressed uh, how the Korean government can est could establish the uh, infra infrastructure so quickly, like uh, mask data. Uh, in Japan, the, we couldn't collect the uh, right. stocks of the, the number of stocks of the, every pharmacies. Mm -hmm. So because they use the, they, the each, the private sectors have different uh, systems to count the uh, stocks. And also the, there is no way to, to get the actual data. Also, uh, in Japan, there is not much the digital IDs uh, that we can use, uh, that government can use. So it, it, it was difficult to limit the uh, uh, how many masks to uh, buy. Uh, sorry, it, 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 it was difficult to limit the people can, how many masks can people can buy. So if the, we, if government uh, open up the uh, the the data. Uh, I think the some of the uh, the unfair reseller went to the pharmacies and buy everything. So that kind of different is the uh, yeah I was uh, thinking. Oh, yeah, um, I think it's a good point that you um, mm -hmm. said that we have to build a trust between people and mm -hmm. the government before mm -hmm. we talk on the technology. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, then um, let's just move to um, another topic. That, um, mm -hmm. You've been tackling these issues all the time for the webinar. And just let's say about just one thing. What would be the most important thing to consider promoting public-private partnership among the many mm -hmm. ways that you've presented in your presentations? Mm -hmm. uh, so so can, you, can you say again the question? Yeah, it's like, um, what do you think mm -hmm. is the most important part when you uh, mm -hmm. promote 
for um, public private partnership between mm -hmm. government and the citizens. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Code for Japan always says uh, think together, create together. Mm -hmm. So we need to make a, build a trust with uh, uh, the actual people who uh, are working on the actual program. Not, uh, not like uh, just using the. I just want to use the uh, technology people. So, yeah. So let's go go to the city department and talk to the uh, people uh, working inside, and let's make some some actual uh, things to solve the problem. Right, right. And um, do you have any other comments, Mr. Cho, from Korea? Yes, I was totally agree. I'm totally ah. agree with the, uh, we should have uh, the, some kind of the platform to share our yeah. knowledge and the data. All right. And also we need to change, or uh, we, we shouldn't to go back to just uh, uh, the economy uh, related the, uh, society. I, I, I want to, uh, yeah, work with uh, uh, every the uh, kind of community members. How to uh, change the society? Right, right. And what what about representative from Korea? Do you have any other comments to make this? Um, okay, um, I'm very similar Halseki's idea. Uh, open government data must always be. Uh, with citizen. Right. So mm -hmm. there was actually two success factors in releasing of mask data. Uh, I just want to uh, share the mask data experience because I enjoyed that project. So uh, that is we actually heard the voice of the citizen and mm -hmm. the collaboration between institutions. In fact, uh, there was a voice raised by citizens for government to release mask data. Uh, do you know Gwanghwamun First Avenue? Uh, the Korean government has a website yes. called Gwanghwamun First Avenue. Gwanghwamun First Avenue is an um, open channel proposed by the citizen to the government. Mm -hmm. On March 4, it's a specific day, one civic hacker asked for the release of COVID-19 data on Gwanghwamun First, First Avenue. And then the government responds right away. Was the mask data able to be released if there was no suggestion by citizen? I don't think so. This is the key. So government should operate a channel uh, where citizen can suggest any idea easily. Mm -hmm. Learning a communication channel is not easy. Everyone know that uh, to accept the opinions of citizens, sometimes government have to change the process of work, but it must be done. In addition, there, there is an, a need for a system to be built that analyze citizen proposal, reviews feasibility, and reviews them. Sometimes take a long time. But we cannot just ignore what citizens want. The organization I, I belong to, NIA, is running an open data portal. And open data portal is constantly taking data demands from the citizen. Uh, for example, environmental pollution data, election pledge data, they all start with the voice of citizen. The second success factor is that we had a very clear division of duties between institutions. Um, as Han Zhong Li, my boss, mentioned previously, many institutions, in, many institutions participated in the, the releasing of the mask data. In just a week, seven institutions work all together to develop a mask app service. Hmm. Our agency, NIA, took on a role as project manager and assigned clear tasks to each institution. 
problems that we had uh, while working were immediately shared online together. Um, let me give you uh, the actual case in here. It has been predicted that many people will use the mask app at the same time, maybe 100 million people. As there were a great attention of citizens, we anticipated that there would be a huge traffic once the mask app would launch. And it did happen as we expect. Citizen developer, a civic hacker, actually told us this expectation. And our government was able to ask cloud computing business to support cloud servers. And thankfully, they let us to use it for free. We are able to predict and solve the problems by constantly communicating with citizen developers. And after launch the app service, and I, um, I, our agency played a law as a service call center. Actually, to be honest, various problem, data editors, map editors, some people talk, blah, blah, but were received through the service call center. These issues were categorized and delivery to each institution for immediate the resolution. On the first day, there were literally about 500 increase and it dramatically dropped to 10 increase after a week. It is the result of the effort of all institutions. Uh, it is very clear I felt while working with releasing the mask data. There is a great effect when we release the data that people want. And the government should focus on releasing data rather than focusing on developing all service for the people. That's, that's all for me. Thank you. Okay, so Han Seki and Mr. Cho, um, they both um, expressed the idea of how it is important to share the ideas of citizens, listen to them, and then build a strong um, trust between the government and citizens. And do you have any additional comments that you would like to make, um, Mr. Pang? Okay, uh, the first things I, I, I want to share is the data governance. For example, in, in, in Taiwan, we have the health ID card, and that health ID card combines all of our uh, health data. For example, mm -hmm. I, how many uh, hospitals I visit and how, which medical doctor uh, I, I got. And uh, later on, uh, because, you know, uh, lots of the uh, travel records is very important. For example, we come from China, we probably the possibility is very, very high. So our government also coupled with the travel data together. So if you go to the hospital, you should plug in your health card, ID card first, mm -hmm. and to get, oh, you travel from from the other country, you uh, you should go to another uh, very uh, secure secure for the security reasons. And so the health card by using the the health ID card uh, coupled with the lots of the data together is very important. And also uh, when we buy the mask and uh, how many masks this week we have already buy the mask or not is also very important. So the government uh, they use the data to better governments. Data governance is very important. And however, recently we are thinking, uh, talking with the government, and uh, when you use lots of data, what's the, the privacy issue in the future? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we ask about, uh, them about uh, you use the location data of our mobile phone. What will you do in the future? But the government still opened all of their source code to us. So, but it's a PVP, it's a public meeting. They mm -hmm. announce this and they invite some of the uh, community to join the meeting. And we know, oh yeah, you, you, you are okay. But we should pro you should promise, you, you should not use this after the COVID-19. So they promise. And also our government also working with the private sector, it's called Taiwan AI Lab. They design a social distance APP. And uh, in the beginning, we worry all of our data. For example, uh, tonight we, we talk with you up in the room and uh, we, will, we are friends. Our government will monitor us in the future. So we ask them, you should open all of the source code. So they also prom promise is open 
to the public. So for example, everyone can use the, the social distance ATP source code to design in your countries. And uh, we also want to see the record together. So I think the privacy about the government, data governance, and uh, also the, the uh, mobile location data, in the future, the privacy, we, we, I think the ethical, the especially the data and the ethical things, we should have a PPP. In the in the future is very important because uh, because in the uh, post COVID nineteen everybody want to be alone and to be safe about the data use in the future. Thank you. <laughs> right. So all three panelists um, have shared the idea of how important it is to listen to the citizens and reflect the ideas into policy while building the data governance with protecting the data privacy of people. So, and then um, let me move to the next question that I haven't touched um, from the floor. The, um, can we all share the, like, any difficulties or hardships that you have experienced and encountered while you are promoting the project in your country? And um, why don't we start with Mr. Cho from Korea? Okay. Um, I will talk briefly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, collecting data is most difficult. Right. I think people are confused when inaccuracy data is shared. So all countries, not just Korea, should focus, focus on uh, collecting data. And the collected data must be released. Uh, it would be a best to release it in open API format because civic hackers using directly, but it would be nice CSV or Excel format. Release the data and the citizen will use it themselves. That's all for me, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And do you have any other comments um, from Hao Seki or Dr. Pong? Okay, can I go too fast? Uh, yeah, sure. and, uh, yeah, uh, there was uh, many difficulty, but uh, one of biggest problem is uh, uh, it's hard to maintain the website for as a uh, as a uh, just a, a volunteer based. Code for Japan itself had a. Uh, itself uh, had a, a project and uh, and we hired people to maintain itself but uh, most of the other regions uh, website it was uh, operated by the uh, voluntary based so it was difficult to uh, sometimes it was difficult to uh, keep updating the data every day, especially it was uh, still in the PDF. So you have to check the website every day and uh, check uh, what is uh, updating, updated. And, it, and sometimes the data was changed and sometimes data, the, the format was changed. So you have to uh, change the, the data. So that kind of the yeah uh, effort uh, should be uh, done every day. So that kind of uh, effort. Okay. Uh, yeah, most of people have uh, uh, strongest motivation, motivation in, in the, the first time, time. but they if you go through the uh, one month of that, it become difficult to keep maintaining. Right, right. Uh, yeah, do you have any uh, last comments, um, Dr. Pong? <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I think the best way you should have a COVID-19 hackathon as soon as possible, because uh, the <laughs> AU, <laughs> they announced uh, Taiwan and US, and we have a hackathon. So I remember I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a judges and uh, more than uh, 50 teams to join. So such is how the data issue also happened. Some of the civil people from civil society do that. Mm. It's very good, successful. <laughs> right, right. We should all um, hold together hackathon for the whole country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah okay. Right. Um, yes, actually, the time has been up. So it was a great honor and pleasure to have all the panelists to the, um, our webinar. And thank you so much once again for um, joining us. So thank you so much. 
Bye. <laughs> Thank you. So before um, I wrap up the webinar today, um, let me just briefly go over what the Asia Open Data Challenge, which will be actually um, held on coming August, um, just for your information. So basically for the 2020 Asia Open Data Challenge, um, everyone can join group of students or developers, uh, startups or businesses, um, IT companies and civic hackers, um, all of you are um, welcome to join. And we are having the under the theme of after Corona, getting the most out of the experience in life. So you are free to create any possible applications or website with the use of multi countries open data and provide by here technologies in this year. And what would you to earn in the Asia Open Data Challenge? So up to um, 3,600 US dollars for the winners. And most importantly, it will be a platform for civic hackers or all the participants to share ideas with the developers from all the countries. And we will be starting our online registration on June 15th, and it will be ending on July 27th. So you have uh, a month to prepare it. And there will be a preliminary selection on August 12th. And the final competition will be virtually held on August 28th. And these are the criteria for the data challenge. So multi-country application and open data utilization, creativity, and technical difficulty and feasibility, and business viability as well. And in this year, we have a here technology with us, and here technology will be sponsoring for another 2,000 amount of US dollar for the special award for the winning team. And just last information for the viewers. So we've actually have a webinar number two is coming. So please save the day on July 8th, which is Wednesday, and it's gonna be held in the same time as today's. So it's gonna be uh, six to eight in Taiwan time and seven to nine in Korea and Japan time. And this time, private sectors um, from um, IT companies like Line AI Solution Company and Organization for Data Driven Application, and also some companies from Korea will be participating and they'll be talking on the open data small life business in after Corona era. So feel free to join us in the webinar number two. So that would be all for the webinar and the Asia Open Data Challenge. So if there are more questions or any concerns, feel free to contact us anytime through this email. So now um, I would like to officially um, wrap up the tonight's webinar. So thank you so much for those who have virtually joined their YouTube. And thank you once again for the panelists. And um, I hope uh, um, everyone have a great night and hope to see you once again in the webinar too. Thank you so much.